In this video, we're going to be continuing our discussion of Jean-Luc Marion, uh, specifically his discussion of the icon. But this video is going to be mostly preparatory material. And in the follow-up video, which will be posted tomorrow, we'll get into some more detail, returning to the concept of the, of the icon and the relationship that Marion sees between it and uh, hermeneutics. So the uh, paper that we're going to be dealing with here is a chapter from Jean-Luc Marion's work entitled, in the English translation, In Excess Studies in Saturated Phenomenon. And these two terms, excess and saturation, as well as phenomenon, are going to be uh, where we're going to be ending up today. Uh, the particular chapter we're going to be dealing with first, we'll be dealing with two chapters from this book uh, in this course, but the first chapter is called The Icon or the Endless Hermeneutic, and that is chapter five of this book. This chapter has five sections, and in this video we're going to give some background to Marian's uh, phenomenology and cover the first two sections. And then in the follow-up video, we'll finish this uh, particular paper uh, with the last three sections. So that's what you have to look to, uh, forward to here. Once again, let me remind you to um, add your comments to each of the three videos uh, for this week in, in the comment box below. And I want to strongly encourage everyone to please engage with uh, your fellow students and the other commentators um, on this video so that we can get some good discussions going. Okay, first up, the first section is called the visible in default, which is a strange sounding sort of title. Uh, what does he mean by this? Well, the background is, of course, phenomenology. And we can't really get into the details of this particular section without uh, bringing to the fore uh, some features of phenomenology that Marion is presupposing and assuming as um, shared background uh, to this discussion. So I'm going to add these in uh, on my trusty whiteboard here one by one and give some basic accounts of these things. Some of these we've encountered before, but I think even for those of you who are quite familiar with phenomenology, it's worth repeating again what exactly it is that we're, we're talking about here. So uh, I'm going to list just the key terms that you might want to keep track of. And if I go too fast over the definitions or accounts of these terms that I'm giving, you can always go back and uh, hit the three um, buttons on the lower right-hand corner below uh, my face here. And it'll allow you to open the transcript and then you can go through and search for the terms and see what it says uh, I said. Uh, about this. And you might keep in mind that sometimes it takes, there's a bit of a lag, it might take 12 hours or a day for the um, transcript to be completed. So um, let's start off with the concept that is one of the first that he mentions in this work, which is uh, the concept of phenomenology itself. And here, basically, when we're dealing with phenomenology, um, this can be defined in various ways. Uh, we're dealing, of course, here with the uh, so-called science of first philosophy that was developed by Edmund Husserl um, around 1900 and thereafter in the, in the first decades of the 20th century. One way to define this would just be as a rigorous and systematic description of the essences of phenomena. So the, the idea of essences or senses, um, meanings in a colloquial way of speaking, uh, are key always to phenomenology, but we're dealing with the way things appear, the way they become visible, not though in an ordinary way, um, not in the everyday mode, but in a kind of rigorous and systematic attempt to get at what's essential. So that's basically what Marion is presupposing here. And there's going to be a lot of controversy around the notion of phenomenology when Marion is writing this. Uh, it's controversial whether such a thing as a phenomenology is even possible, whether people who are engaged in it are necessarily deceiving themselves in some way. And so uh, you should keep in mind that he is, in a certain sense, writing in a kind of apologetic mode, an apology for phenomenology. He's trying to defend this idea of the possibility of a rigorous and systematic description of the essences of phenomena. 
So, of course, phenomenology implies phenomena, and we need to ask then next the question of what exactly we mean by a phenomena. And here is where, I mean, to completely uh, unpack this notion of a phenomena, we need to, a phenomenon in the singular, we need to uh, describe the various technical terms that pertain to the way in which uh, phenomena are um, constructed within phenomenology. So the first thing that comes up is uh, the concept of the phenomenological reduction. And I believe I've already mentioned this in the past in the course, the idea of a reduction. Uh, the easiest way to understand this is to think of Descartes' meditations, in which Descartes asks himself, how do I know that anything in my everyday reality is actually real, that it exists at all outside of my mind? And he's shocked to discover in the course of his meditations, at least initially, that he doesn't know this. At least he doesn't know it immediately. Uh, what he knows immediately are just what, uh, in a phenomenological context, we could call phenomena. Things as they appear to me. Right, so in the notion of a reduction, what we're dealing with is something like a reduction of existing things or beings to mere phenomena, to mere appearances for uh, a consciousness or a, an ego, an I. I see this, this way. I don't know if it exists, but this is the way I see it. You know, maybe my hand isn't really here. Uh, but it seems to me it's here, right? And at least I know that it seems to me that there's a phenomenon here. That's a reduction, um, the basic idea of a reduction. And that's sort of the first initial phenomenological move. The re a thing being reduced from being a really existing being to being just an object for consciousness and appearing. And another uh, term that goes along with this, and I've already mentioned this, briefly last time, and also another context in this course, uh, and that's the idea of an intentional object, an intentional object. Um, so the intentional object is an object of an intention, and this is uh, a technical term in phenomenology. To intend something is to direct consciousness towards it. It's related to the idea of an aim, and sometimes, uh, you'll, of course, in this very essay, the concept of an intentional aim is important. But it's not our usual aim. It's not, it's not the sense of a desire or a purpose I have, but rather it involves a particular mode or a particular way in which I direct my consciousness towards something. Now, that's, that's very vague and abstract, but uh, we can get a little bit more detail here if we look uh, just at some of what Marion says. So if we look on page uh, 107, uh, he makes clear from a phenomenological standpoint how the object itself and its sense and its meaning is in a certain way relative to the intention, to the intentional aim, to the way or the mode in which consciousness is directed towards that object. So he says here, this is in the second paragraph on page 107, about five lines down. First he says, No object can truly appear as such if just any aim, whatever, is exercised on it. In order to, as, to appear as such, it requires a particular aim, privileged and adapted, whether to its finality and its usefulness, in the case of a technical object or tool, a common object, an object ready to hand, zuhanden in, in German, which is a Heideggerian term, or simply to its definition and its essence, as in the case of a subsistent object, an object present at hand, vorhanden, which would be like an object that was under scientific investigation. Even an object as simple as the box that we were analyzing, we'll come back to this box, the box, a tobacco box, but uh, don't smoke. It only appears as the object that it is and demands to be if a precise intentionality is applied to it. The one that aims precisely not at what one could see, and he describes what that is here in the case of the box, a simple parallel piped, closed, and probably empty, given that it is quite light. 
but what one can do with it, which is not seen at first, a box to open and close again, because it is destined to contain a fragile material. An aim, which would be restricted to picking up what the sketches leave to be perceived, would indeed not see this object as such. In order to constitute it in its proper phenomenality, it is not a matter of what is perceived, but of what is perceived in as much as ordered to definition, to essence, in short, to the sense of the object. So what is he describing here? Well, um, I don't have a tobacco box here because I don't smoke pipe tobacco or anything. However, um, if we take as an alternative here something like this pencil. Now, it may be that some of you that are listening to this right now uh, will have children in the future who uh, will not know what this is. So when you ask them, you know, find me a pencil in the drawer, they'll look at you with a blank stare and say, what? Pencil? What's that? And then, you know, you would describe it to them. And then they would be able to form a kind of intention in this phenomenological sense. They'd be able to form a sense of what my consciousness should be directed towards. Now, that would include things like the shape of the pencil, roughly speaking, and so on. Uh, but it would also include an idea of what the pencil is for, what its meaning is. You know, how does this fit into our human world? I can describe this in all kinds of ways without... Um, necessarily knowing that this is an implement intended for writing. Someone in the future who may come across this thing might be able to describe it or, you know, send a text message to someone describing what this thing is without knowing what, what it was used for back, uh, you know, in the day when people still use pencils. So that gives you a sense of the way in which the intention is crucial to uh, allowing a phenomenon to become the sort of object it is within our consciousness, at least. Intentions are particular and relative to particular objects, and it's only in having a certain sort of intention in this technical phenomenological sense that an object is able to, we might say, show up for me as the type of object it is. So that's um, involved in this idea of, of an intention, or we could add to this um, the idea of an intentional aim. Right? So you can, these are very closely related concepts, the intention or the intentional aim. All right, next, we have the idea of an intuition. And uh, of course, it has an everyday sense. It has a Kantian sense, for those of you familiar with Kant. Uh, in the phenomenological sense, derived from uh, Husserl, the idea of an intuition is primarily um, understood as the fulfillment of an intention, the filling of an intention, you might say. So, um, if you think of the idea of a pencil as being an intention or intentional aim, when I say to you, find me a pencil in that drawer, in order for you to be able to carry out that instruction, you already have to have in your mind a certain intention, a certain intentional aim, an idea, roughly colloquially speaking, of what you're looking for. And then you're looking through the drawer and you see something, you pull out a rubber band, you look, that's not it. You see a pen, no, that's not it. You see, you know, dry erase markers, you say, that's not it. And then all of a sudden, your intention is fulfilled. And that's what it's fulfilled by is the intuition, right? So there's a kind of correlation between an intention or an intentional aim and an intuition. An intuition would be what fulfills that intentional aim. So that's the relationship between these ideas here of the intention and the intentional aim. So also we can think of the intentional object is the object as I so to speak, conceive of it in my mind, the thing I'm looking for. And then the intuitive content is what fulfills that um, intentional object. Okay. So that brings us to, um, I don't know how many terms we have here, four or five, uh, to the notion of givenness, which is very important. So if you've got the givenness of the... Um, phenomenon. In Husserl, he describes this as what offers itself originarily in intuition. Originarily in intuition. So, um, you know, it's the first. It's the, it's the origin. It's the first thing that, account, that is encountered in intuition. Uh, when I see this, you know, uh, particular object that I had an intentional aim directed towards, uh, what is given? Well, you know, a certain shape, right? A certain uh, color or the sensations, we might say. But we 
we, if we're phenomenologists, we want to take care to describe this accurately in terms of its givenness. Why is this important? Well, Husserl argued that uh, what's originarily given in intuition is what he calls a source of right, a source of right. That is, it's sort of like the idea of a, of a criminal, uh, or accused criminal, I should say. That's the whole point. An accused criminal, not necessarily a criminal. Uh, you know, on the, um, on the news, when someone is arrested or tried for a crime, they always say it's alleged, right? Why is that? Because a person is understood to be innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, in our um, system of justice. And so similarly, you might say that for Husserl, what's given to us originarily in intuition is innocent until proven guilty. We take it, in other words, to describe something that is as it actually is, unless we have some defeater or some reason to think otherwise. So it may be that, you know, this object isn't actually yellow, but I would need to have some other stronger intuition or intuitive basis in order to rule that out ultimately, which might also ultimately be connected to some extensive scientific theory or, or what have you. But at any rate, the, ultimately what's originarily given in intuition is uh, the source of right. So this idea of givenness is, is crucial for phenomenology. It, it provides something analogous to a foundation, but the analogous part is important here because in many ways phenomenology, certainly as it appears in Marion, is, um, is somewhat um, hesitant to, uh, uh, to say the least, to identify itself with foundationalism. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. But at any rate, that gives you a first approximation if you're not familiar with this notion of, of the givenness of the phenomena, what's originarily given in intuition and that provides a source of right for um, claims of knowledge and existence and essence and so forth. All right, next uh, is the concept of the visible. This one is pretty easy, actually. It's what characterizes an object that appears. An object that appears is visible. So obviously there's a sort of um, prejudice in favor of the eye, of the, of the optical, uh, over the other senses here. But they, of course, that's also traditionally um, the way the phenomena are understood. Um, it's primarily things that appear to us within our um, visual apparatus. So whatever characterizes an object that appears, that's, that's the visible, the appearance of something. And so there's going to be a very tight connection between phenomenology itself and visibility or the visible. And this generates a lot of the problems in, in Marian's paper because he's really concerned here with the possibility of a phenomenology of the invisible or the unseen, um, Len, Len Vu, as he, as he describes it in his French neologism, but I'm going to try to mostly just refer to the unseen or the not seen, um, because it raises this question. I mean, phenomenology is the uh, logos of the phenomenon in, in its very name, in its very definition. It's the, the systematic, rigorous description or account of phenomena. So how can we have a phenomenology of something that isn't visible, that doesn't appear, that isn't a phenomenon, it would seem? Okay, so we talked a little bit about that. We anticipated part of this problem in connection with the icon last time. But this is a, an issue that he's going to be continuing to pursue and develop in his uh, version of phenomenology. Okay, next uh, is the concept of lived experience. Here we're talking about, um, so you, you want to ask lived experience as opposed to what? Right? That would be the uh, obvious question to ask here. Lived experience is experience that occurs in the course of ordinary life. That is to say, not in a philosophical or scientific context. So it's the way that, that experience occurs when you're just going about your business in everyday life. Um, and phenomenology, especially after Heidegger, but also in Husserl, is going to be very concerned to be sensitive to the uh, apparent priority of phenomena that appear within our lived experience. Because uh, at least since classical empiricism, um, maybe since Descartes, there's been a tendency to perhaps distort the notion of experience by emphasizing scientific experience or philosophical sort of artificial thought experiments um, above our everyday lived experience. So that's what how that concept um, comes into play in uh, phenomenology. 
Then, of course, there's the important concept of constitution. So constitution is the act of consciousness whereby um, the given is transmuted into an object. The act of consciousness whereby the given, what we were talking about earlier as givenness, whereby it's transmuted into an object. And we'll have a lot more to say about that shortly. Uh, in part of this uh, notion of constitution, part of what constitutes it, will be this notion derived from Husserl of uh, app presentation. Uh, this seems to allude to Kant's famous notion of app perception. Uh, app perception is a perception that's turned back on itself. So it's a, it's a fancy technical philosophical term for something like self-consciousness. Uh, at the most general level, so a kind of general reflectiveness that's intrinsically part of consciousness itself. And Kant famously argues that to be conscious is to apperceive it at the same time, uh, before Kant Leibniz also had a, had a theory of apperception um, along those lines. Um, so app presentation, uh, in Husserl's understanding that Marianne will take over, is an association of the visible with the unseen or the invisible in the process of constituting an object. The association of the visible with the unseen or the invisible in the process of constituting an object. So app presentation then connects these ideas of um, constitution and visibility uh, and objective intention and, and so on. So it's a combination of all of these or many of these technical uh, terms that we've just gone over. Okay. Then finally, um, we have, and I ran out of room on the board, so we're going to have a little extra. Uh, as promised, these two concepts of uh, excess over here and saturation. So excess is an excessiveness in the givenness of the phenomenon, an excessiveness in the givenness of the phenomenon. It's a quality, if you will, of, the, uh, of givenness. Uh, and saturation is closely, closely related to this. It's, it's the way that he further specifies, really, what kind of uh, excess, at least the, the kind that he's uh, principally interested in, is through saturation. And, and that's as far as we're going to get today. We'll, we'll talk uh, in a little bit more detail about how he applies these concepts that I just went over uh, in the first two sections of this essay. And then uh, we'll end uh, just at the beginning of section three, and that will allow us to um, talk about excess and saturation in more detail uh, going forward. All right. Let me take a swig of my Coke Zero. Clear my throat. Um, so, why is Marian concerned with the, this notion of excess or saturation at all, or givenness for that matter? Uh, in the background here, uh, there's a little bit of um, the anti-metaphysical trends that uh, predominate so much in continental philosophy in the 20th century and still today. Uh, in particular, Jacques Derrida's critique of presence is in the background here. And very roughly speaking, uh, very crudely speaking, the idea here in the critique of presence is that According to him, Western Derrida, that is, Western metaphysics uh, has had an ambition to establish an absolute, a self-contained, self-coincident foundation for being in knowledge. Um, so the idea is very much connected with the idea of um, a well-bounded and well-defined object or being that could serve as sort of an Archimedean point or a, re a reference point on which we could build our knowledge. That's the Cartesian idea, right? If only I could find one immovable point, then I could finally establish the sciences, Descartes said. And that's um, a metaphysical idea that, that actually both Derrida and uh, Marion are critical of. And Marion learned a lot from Derrida, and so he um, you know, takes that criticism to heart, um, the idea that, that this is a kind of feudal ambition to establish this sort of metaphysical foundation. So the references to excess, and indeed to givenness too, are a means of acknowledging 
that the given, as he conceives it, is not metaphysical in this way. So, so the givenness is not to be understood as an absolute. Uh, there are some concepts, uh, but certainly, you know, if you connect the idea of the given with the idea of Cartesian certainty, you know, I can't be, I can't doubt the way things appear to me, this kind of idea. And what's, what appears to me is completely given and encompassed by my mind, those sorts of ideas. Uh, then, if, you know, you might think of the idea of the given as, as just another metaphysical idea of the absolute. Uh, but this is not what Marion wants to uh, advance, is his notion of the given. So that's part of where the idea of excess comes, comes in here, and the emphasis on the invisible. So um, the given, as he conceives it, is not supposed to be metaphysical. Instead, he emphasizes the interpenetration of the visible and the invisible in the appearing of the phenomenon. We already discussed this idea of an interpenetration of the visible and the invisible um, last time in connection with the icon and drawing also on Levinas's notion of the face, in which the invisible personality, um, Levinas talks about the call that comes from the face, the call that says in the person's face, don't kill me, that interpenetrates the merely physical visage. So the merely physical, the plastic appearance of my, you know, plastic form that may have had plastic surgery in some cases, although obviously not in my case. But uh, that kind of plastic form of the face, the physical form, um, is, is, is not the face in the Levinasian sense. The face is this sort of invisible that interpenetrates that visible uh, and that presents a person to you. Um, a person who, who makes a call on you that's an ethical call that says, don't harm me, don't kill me. So we already saw that uh, aspect of it. But now um, we're going to be broadening this notion of a, an interpenetration between the visible and the invisible. That's really, in a lot of ways, the, the central notion we're going to be talking about here, the interpenetration of the visible and the, the invisible, what he calls l'invu, like deja vu, except invu, so the um, something that I saw before, right, deja vu, uh, the invu is the not seen, the unseen, right? So the, the visible and the the unseen are going to be seen to have a kind of relationship of interpenetration between uh, each other. Um, in general, in, in all phenomena, in all phenomena, at least in the objects of our lived experience. Uh, maybe not in the case of some abstract objects like um, the objects that are uh, studied in geometry, for example, or some scientific models. But in the objects of our everyday experience, there's going to be this interpenetration of the visible and the invisible. Okay, so what's, um, what's he going to be saying here in this first section? which is entitled, The Visible in Default. The Visible in Default. That, of course, suggests this idea that, you know, when you're in default, you know, you're in default on loan and the repo guys come and take your car or whatever, right? That it doesn't, it doesn't pay, it hasn't been able to pay off what it promised. That kind of idea of, of default. Um, there's also an idea here that the, the default position of a visible thing is to have an invisible or unseen um, that interpenetrates it. So both of those are contained in that notion. So the thesis of this section can be best summarized in the statement that we find on page uh, 105, at the very bottom there of the, the long paragraph. The statement that the visible only breaks forth into day constrained to finitude, crowned with an invisible by default, le in vue, the not seen or the unseen in English. And this is something that can be seen through a phenomenological analysis of any ordinary object. And on page 104, Marion gives this detailed analysis of his tobacco box. I mean, we could use anything, we could use the Kleenex box. And this idea that, you know, what I intend is something that's a three dimensional object. But of course, uh, the side I see is really only this side. Of course, now I have the mirror because I've got the camera in front of me so I can see both sides at once, but that's cheating. Um, but I can't see the bottom, right? I still can't see the bottom here. But I can, of course, turn it around and I can see the bottom, see the brand and so on. 
This video brought to you by Kleenex brand. Um, I can look at my pencil, you know, my pencil has, I think, six sides, and I can only see three at once. And I can keep turning it, and I can see the others, but at one time, I can only see um, a particular side that presents itself to me. And Marion summarizes this by saying, in the phenomenon of the object, app presentation, remember this notion of app presentation, uh, can be displaced, but it's never eliminated. Um, so, what I see here is a three-dimensional object. What I see here is a three-dimensional object, but I never see everything that's necessary in order to constitute it as a three-dimensional object. I only see part of it. I only see half of it. But at the same time, my consciousness, as it were, um, adds to it the um, unseen side in my constitution of it as an object. You know, I don't see um, you know a house across the street for me as merely like an old-fashioned Hollywood prop, you know, where they'd have just a painting of a house and then behind it would just be flat. And it would be propped up by a couple two-by-fours or something like that. Rather, what I see, if I see a house, is I see an object that has these other dimensions that includes an unseen that interpenetrates it. And that is analogous to the way in which, in the Levinasian idea of the face, the personality interpenetrates the merely plastic features of the visage, the merely physical features. So... In the phenomenon of the object, at presentation can be displaced, but it is never eliminated. I can displace the, the, the at presentation of the back side here by turning this around. Now I'm at presenting this other side, right? But, um, and I, but I just, just, I've just displaced it. Uh, I haven't actually eliminated it. I always have to rely on a kind of at presentation. So that's the first point. The second point is that all apresentation presents a there with, a there with, right? The back side is there with the front side. The bottom side is there with the top side. Um, a there with, which is nevertheless not itself there and can never become a self there. So it, it's both there and not there in the phenomenon we're talking about, in what's given, right? In the object, as I constitute it, it's both there and not there. It's, it's, it's there in the sense that it's in the object, but it's not there in the sense that it's not, it's not in what's in my intuition or what's immediately given to me. Um, all constitution, he says, encounters a weakness of the self there. A weakness of the self there. What is this self there? The self there. We need to add this. Yes, let's add this. It's one of these sort of, um, I mean, the, the, the French term is a different term, but we won't mess around with that. But the self there is, seems to imply this idea of a kind of complete self-coincidence or full presence. Marianne refers to it as an incompatibility of lived experiences, a completeness of the visible within the visible itself. Uh, this is something that, you know, we don't actually find is, is in a strong sense. There is, of course, um, you know, the thing, there is the object there. I mean, if we persona, we usually refer to uh, the self in a um, um, personified way. But of course, we can talk about, you know, the pencil itself, right? The pencil itself enables you to write a letter. You don't need a pen or whatever. Um, so you, you have this idea of itself that is applied to inanimate objects. It's, it's that sense of self, the, the integrity, the wholeness, the oneness, the unity, the self-coincidence. That self-coincidence is a, is a weak self-coincidence because there's always this thing that is, that is invisible in the phenomenon. We can displace it by turning the thing around, right? but we can never eliminate it. Okay, So this would be a, an important point to be able to... Um, sort of uh, reconcile yourself to is at least a phenomenological perspective. And if you have questions about this, this would be a good uh, point to raise questions about. What is this idea of the weakness of the self that it belongs to any uh, object that's constituted through an intention of this kind? So there's an absence in, in, in every presence. And this is conditioned by space in an obvious way that we've been uh, looking at here. You know, we know that the three-dimensionality of the Kleenex box or the pencil are what uh, uh, produce this requirement of uh, app presentation in our constitution. 
but um, it's also uh, imposed by time in various ways. So first he says space imposes the law and imposes having recourse to apresentation in order to constitute the least object. Um, that's still on, on page 105. But he goes on in uh, 106 and 107 to describe various ways in which time also, or temporalization, as he says, um, also imposes this kind of weakness um, of the object or of the constitution. A constitution takes place under conditions of temporal delay, uh, which exacerbates the problem. This temporal delay in constitution also is uh, something that involves what Marianne describes as a burden of the unseen within the visible. So uh, there are three ways in which he describes this. First of all, obviously, to see all sides of the object and to arrive at a complete constitution of the idea of it as an object requires time. Right? It requires, I mean, not a long period of time if I'm dealing with a simple object like this, but if I wanted to arrive at a kind of uh, fulfillment of an intention of um, the way a particular house was laid out, right? It might take me quite a while to walk through it. So all sides of an object, to see all of them, uh, it takes time. Second, every object changes during the time in which it is constituted. I mean, we might not notice it, but in fact, this, um, you know, object here has changed in this time. Uh, it's, you know, the, the paper has, be, has decayed a little bit. Of course, it's so slow that we don't see it, but if you came back to this in 50 years or something, it would appear very different. It would smell different um, in a lot of different ways, right? So uh, whether the object's a manufactured object or, of course, whether it's a living object that ripens or ages, uh, you're dealing with an object that changes. Um, and third, the identity of the object itself, its self-identity, Rather, I'm sorry, excuse me, the identity of the object to itself or its self-identity, um, that is to say that the idea that this pencil that I'm holding up here is the same pencil as the one I originally used to illustrate this point a few minutes ago. This Kleenex box that I'm holding up here is the same Kleenex box as the one I originally used a few minutes ago. This glass here, which you can, by the way, see the illustration of change because the ice has begun to melt more than it did before, if you um, rewind. Um, this is still the same as the one that I used a few minutes ago. In order to be able to determine that, it requires what he calls an original impression of temporality, an original impression of temporality. And what does he have in mind here? I think, if I understand him correctly, um, what he's describing here is something like a common time frame. So there has to be something in reference, something that st stays stable, stays the same in reference to which I'm able to somehow identify that this actually is the same glass. Um, you know, so this is a similar sort of problem to the one that Kant deals with in the first analogy of experience, for those of you who've studied your critique of pure reason. There has to be a common time frame. So in addition to the way in which space provides the law that imposes the recourse to apresentation in the constitution of the least object, similarly time in these three ways, it takes time to see all sides of the object, every object changes during the time in which it's constituted, and it requires a certain um, original impression of temporality, a kind of time frame in order to um, maintain its self-identity. In all three of those ways, uh, time or temporality, temporalization also uh, helps to, or is necessary to impose, um, makes it necessary rather to impose uh, the uh, burden of the unseen, as he says. Okay. And then finally, in addition to space and time, which uh, imply a kind of burden of the unseen, a kind of necessity for appresentation of the invisible, uh, there's a third thing, which is constitution itself. Insofar as constitution, uh, as the intentional aim, remember that, uh, involves a kind of, he calls it a gift of sense, or a donating of sense to the object. My intentional aim provides a kind of sense to this. I, I recognize this as Kleenex and has a certain function and so forth. And that's something I give to it. Um, I impose this on it in my very constitutive act. But that sense is not something that resides visibly in the Kleenex. You know, what it is to be uh, a box of Kleenex, whatever, however you understand that sense, that essence of Kleenexness, isn't something that is, that is just here. I wouldn't destroy 
you know, Kleenex ness or tissue ish ness um, by burning this box. You know, that, it's, that sense, that essence would still exist. Uh, so that, that's the third element in addition to space and time that is an invisible or an unseen. Okay? Uh, so what have we done in this section? Well, we basically showed that this idea of an interpenetration of the invisible or the unseen into the visible is part of the constitution of any object of ordinary experience. Now, Marion acknowledges that there might be some exceptions to this, but not within lived experience. The exceptions would have to be in very artificial situations, such as, you know, a particular controlled scientific experiment um, in a kind of mathematical situation where you're dealing with objects that are, are very abstract. But in lived experience, the, the sort of the messy, um, tactile, rich objects of our lived experience are always going to involve this interpenetration of the invisible to the visible. So why is this important? Always a good question to ask about any philosophical point that's being put forth. Uh, this brings us to the second section, which begins on page 109. In this section, Marion draws some suggestions or results from the preceding section. If it's true that all phenomenological constitution only produces a visible in showing just as much not seen or invisible, then he suggests it might be possible to produce a phenomenology of the unapparent or the invisible or perhaps the inconspicuous, um, that which does not appear, the unapparent. And here, Marion is making a connection between his just outlined concept of the, uh, the in vu or the unseen, the not seen, and a formula that's produced by Heidegger uh, in this uh, definition from 1973 that he discusses on page 110 uh, about the Ereignis. He says, this is on page 110, about six lines down, uh, the Ereignis, or the event, the least apparent of the unapparent, the least apparent of the unapparent. In Marianne comments, thus in a radical sense, it signals a thought still to come, which sort of go back on this side of time and of being and only admit the one thing necessary to bring thought and his thought into the clearing of the appearing of the unapparent, the appearing of the unapparent. So Marion is taking inspiration um, from this, but uh, it's clear that he doesn't think that Heidegger's, what Heidegger's thinking of here is adequate to what he has in mind. Because according to this line, continuing to read, a phenomenology of the unimparent would apply a transcending of phenomenology itself beyond the gaps between subject and object, noesis and noema, intentionality and constitution, even, belong the, even beyond the, 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 the reduction. Evidently, I neither acknowledge this ambition as Heidegger's own nor take this risk. The phenomenology of the unapparent, therefore, cannot serve us here as a model. In other words, he wants to still insist on the validity of phenomenology as a method, even when you're trying to apply it to the unapparent. Whereas here, the way he's reading Heidegger, at least, Heidegger is saying that we need to go beyond the, every aspect of, at least, Husserlian phenomenology uh, in order to the phenomenology of Husserl in order to be able to have a, a, a account, a philosophical account of the appearing of the, of the unapparent. Um, he goes on to say that there's another possibility here that where uh, the phenomenology is not first required where phenomena are not already given and constituted, but only where they remain dissimilated or still invisible. On this conception, phenomenology is the making visible of the invisible. That would be another way of understanding um, how there could be a phenomenology of the invisible. It's the making visible of the invisible. Uh, and that also is inspired by uh, Heidegger, very early, the very early thought of Heidegger and continually throughout his thought. But here, and now we're um, transitioning to page 111, here, there's another difficulty that he immediately notices, and this difficulty is, as he states here, uh, six lines down on page 111, does not such a conversion of the not yet visible into a visible phenomenon define all phenomenology worthy of the name? In other words, 
Um, if we have a phenomenology of the invisible, doesn't that have to render the invisible visible? And if it doesn't, how can this be phenomenology still? Now, this is not um, a pointed rhetorical question for Marion. I mean, he, he thinks there is an answer, but this is a problem. This is obviously uh, a problem if you conceive a phenomenology along the lines uh, described here in this gloss or paraphrase of Heidegger on page 110 as the making of the invisible visible. How can we make the invisible visible? Um, so how are we going to approach this question? At the end of the paragraph on 111, he says, what invisible, which mode of invisibility renders possible the assignment of la vue to the visible and thereby the visible itself? What invisible renders possible the assignment of the unseen or the not seen to the visible? It's a complicated syntax there. So what there's an it's suggesting there's an invisible or a mode of invisibility that renders possible the assignment of the not seen to the visible. Okay. Well, here's what brings us to the idea of excess. On page 112, uh, in the second paragraph, Marion summarizes his approach this way. He says, I am therefore proposing to follow another way to accede to such an invisible and to justify it phenomenologically, to consider phenomena where the duality between intention, signification, and intuition, fulfillment, certainly remains, as well as the noetic nomadic correlation, but where, to the contrary of poor and common phenomena, Intuition gives itself in exceeding what the concept, the signification, the intentionality, the aim, and so on, can foresee of it and show. I call these saturated phenomena or paradoxes. So what he has in, in mind here is, first of all, that the, the typical um, relationship between the intention and the intuition is one in our everyday lives where the intention exceeds the intuition. The intuition is relatively poor, right? So I need a glass to put my Coke Zero in. So I look around for a glass. Any glass matters. It doesn't need to be the perfect glass. It doesn't need to be all things to all people who would want a glass. You know, I chose this glass. I could have chosen half a dozen other types of glass. Now, excuse me. Now you see why I brought this. Oh, geez. Um, in other words, this, you know, my idea of a glass, my intention when I'm looking for, I'm looking for a glass, isn't completely filled with this intuition. It is filled, but it doesn't fulfill my intention in every possible way. So there's a kind of poverty of intuition. And this is the normal, the typical case. What he's describing as an excessive intuition are cases where my intuition is actually exceeded, or rather my, my intention is actually exceeded by my intuition. So some examples of this he gives. He gives four examples of this on page 112. Um, we don't have any space really left on our whiteboard, so maybe we can just describe these and you can look at the transcript. Uh, the first one is the event. The second one is the idol. The third is the flesh. And the fourth is the icon. So the examples of saturated phenomena are event, idol, flesh, and icon. Now there's a lot to be said about all of these. And really the, the, the idea of, uh, of an excess of givenness of a saturated phenomenon can really only be given um, content and, and signif uh, sig significance if we um, look in some detail at the, these examples. And we, of course, are not going to be looking at all of these, uh, but we're going to be focusing on the, the way in which uh, the idol and the icon are um, saturated phenomenon and contain an excess of givenness. So uh, that does it for today. We'll continue this um, essay uh, or paper or chapter from In Excess um, on the next installment.